Well, it's offering time. <laughs> and we're talking about the rich, young ruler, a very wealthy, young man of authority. Mark 10. And I want to bring out tonight with the help of the Holy Spirit, in fact, we'll, we'll take a little time here and cover this ground thoroughly because there are some that, that weren't here and there, there are, of course, a lot of people online. A lot of people are online. <clears throat> the 10th chapter of Mark. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Praise you, Lord Jesus. Now look in the 17th verse, and let's read this very carefully. When he, Jesus, was gone forth into the way, there came one running. That's very significant. He, he, he came running and kneeled to him and asked him, good master or good teacher, good teacher. What shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? That's the question. Amen. What shall I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus said unto him, Why callest thou me good? There is none good but one, that is God. You know the commandments. Do not commit adultery, do not kill, do not steal, do not bear false witness. Defraud not, honor thy father and mother. And he answered and said to him, Teacher, Master, all these things have I observed from my youth. Then Jesus, beholding him, loved him. He loved him. Well, of course he loved him. I mean, he, he's good and he is, he is God who is love. He's God manifested in the flesh. But he is love. But the scripture makes a point of the look of love. The look of love. Oh, I tell you what, I, that, that song when he was on the cross. Mm -hmm. The look of love was on his face thorns on his head. The look of love comes from that right there. The look of love. He loved him. See, Jesus beholding, looking, beholding him, loved him and said unto him, one thing thou lackest, go thy way, sell whatsoever thou hast and give to the poor and thou shalt have treasure in heaven. Come, take up the cross and follow me. And he was sad at that saying, and he went away. He went away grieved. For he had great possessions. He just didn't hang around long enough. Jesus looked around about and said unto his disciples, How hardly shall they that have riches enter into the kingdom of God? And the disciples were astonished at his words. 
But Jesus answered again and saith unto them, Children, how hard it is for them that trust in riches to enter into the kingdom of God. Now, this young man should have heard that. He should have had that, heard that because he was trusting in that money. That's the reason it grieved him. He considered it a loss to sell what he had and give. Selling's one thing, but giving it all to the poor? Come on, what's the matter with you, man? <laughs> and they were his disciples were astonished out of measure. It's obvious they weren't poor. That's obvious. So that takes that religious tradition and just puts it completely out of having any kind of truth in it. All of these men, Peter and John and James' dad, Mr. Zebedee, were partners in this fishing business. And Peter was the chief partner. Amen. And did very well. Now, Matthew was a wealthy man. Now, how he got it was a little iffy <laughs> because he's a tax collector. But hey, Jesus fixed that forever. These men were used to handling a lot of money. They, they were in business. Wasn't a preacher among the bunch. It's like when Gloria said, I will never, ever marry a preacher. <laughs> and she said, the preachers that I knew, you know. <laughs> of course, she said that with a smile on her face. But she didn't. She didn't marry a preacher. She married an airplane pilot. And it's turned out to be one. <laughs> No, that's what I was called to be all the time. I really, I, I got a glimpse of it when I was in high school at church camp. I, I got just a, just a little, you know, Southern Baptist church camp. And, and I, I got a glimpse of it and I came home from that camp. I, I just, it was in my heart. And I, I won't go into all that story. It was there all the time. Had to be because my mother dedicated me to Jesus the day I was born. Amen. So anyway, let's get back to this. Jesus looking upon them saith with men, it is impossible, but not with God. For with God, all things are possible. Isn't that good? Yes. With God, all things are possible. Jesus said that more than once. Then he, he turned around and said, all things are possible to him that believes. Ooh, really? Absolutely. So, now we're just, we're, you know, we're just kind of nitpicking this thing and there's purpose for it tonight. Then Peter began to say unto him, Lo, <laughs> we've left all and have followed thee. Now, people just kind of breeze over that, you know. But he was, he was speaking and he had the heart and mind of all of them there. We have walked away from all of them to follow you. <clears throat> Jesus answered and said, Verily, I say unto you, 
There is no man, nobody. There is no one, no man that hath left house or brethren or sisters or father or mother or wife or children or lands for my sake and the gospels, but he shall receive a hundredfold now in this time houses, brethren, sisters, mothers, children, and lands with persecutions. Well, of course, the devil is a persecutor. He's the liar and the father of it. He's a defeated foe. And when you go getting over into the money area and particularly in things, when things begin to come your way, I'm telling you, it gets all over him and he does his best because you're, you're going to stand up and give God the praise for it and give Jesus all the glory and he can't stand that. I've said it already since I've been here and I'm going to say it again. If you're not being persecuted, you're not doing very much. And a lot of you are being persecuted and don't know it because they're saying it behind your back. Oh yeah, they're talking about you. You know, some of them saw you come in here. <laughs> you can get in trouble coming in this church. They're going over at that faith bunch. Yes. Yes. And they have a crazy white preacher that comes in there and wants to. <laughs> I'll have you to know I am a man of color. My mother, my grandfather, Cherokee Indian. My mother was born in Venita, Oklahoma, in the heart of the Cherokee Nation. My grandfather named her after Venita, and they pronounced it Venetta. Amen. And the first time I went to Ireland. Now, my dad, the Copeland name is an English Scotch name. And my dad's people were Scotch, it's called Scots-Irish, but my dad's people were Scot-Irish and came from Northern Ireland. And G.W. MacDonald was a circuit-riding preacher. MacDonald, but he's kinfolks. So the first time I preached in Ireland and I introduced myself, and I'm Kenneth Copeland. My father was from Ireland, <laughs> and my mother was a red savage. <laughs> she was anything but savage. <laughs> Praise God. Notice, and in the world to come, eternal life. He just answered the man's question and he was not there to hear it. He was so hung up on the money he even forgot his own question and he left. His problem, it didn't hurt anything for him to get mad. Jesus was loving him. Yet that wouldn't have lasted very long. All he had to do was hang around 
five minutes, his question would have been answered. There it was. All he had to do is sell what he had. Now, wait a minute. Sell what he had and give to the poor? You couldn't do this in a few days. He had great possession. But if he'd stayed around, come and take up the cross and follow me, he would have still been selling property, most likely, unless he just dumped it on the market, which wouldn't have hurt anything either. He still would have had a lot of money to give into the kingdom of God. But if he had just stayed around 10 minutes and heard these precious words come from the lips of the man he called master and allowed him to be master, his question would have been answered. Don't jump and run. in an offering. Listen, don't just be a bucket plunker. (laughs) Amen. And it, it, no, no offering is the final one. You're going to keep sowing. You're going to keep giving. You're going to keep doing this a long time. Amen. Because we're giving people. That's what we do. Didn't you like what Jerry said about that? I'm a sower. That's what I do. And I was thinking his grandfather was a farmer. My grandfather was a farmer. (laughs) Glory to God. That's what they did. That's what my grandfather did. He didn't want to do anything else, and neither did Jerry's grandfather. Jerry's grandfather's in that good old Mississippi Delta soil, and my grandfather's up there on the plains of Texas where you grow, you don't grow cotton crops, you grow, you grow bales of cotton. He had wheat. That's what he did. That was his life. It wasn't his living. It was his life. I learned the joy of sowing and giving when I didn't have anything to give. And I gave the Lord my my everything. And I said, I will never let an offering go by again without sowing into it. So what do you do? You cut buttons off your shirt. I saw Jerry Savelle one night take his shoes off. He didn't have anything else. And put them in the offering. And people started giving him shoes. He, he started sewing his clothes. See, when he came with us, all of his clothes had his name on it. Jerry's paint and body shop. <laughs> He's still in the body business. He's just in the business of healing them. <laughs> but he didn't have any clothes. And, and he, but you know, all he had was his uniforms. And so then he came, he came with me. <laughs> and he did, and he's, he's trying to, you know, he's trying to wear this shirt today and these britches tomorrow and this, you know, just swapping and going around. And we were in the middle of Odessa area and my dad said, do, do you think Jerry would mind if I buy him a new suit? I said, Dad, I think he wouldn't mind at all. And that was the only suit he had. Well, you know, I had three. 
<laughs> and my dad bought one of those. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> he started sewing clothes because he needed clothes. And a suit would come and he'd give, and he'd, so he'd sew one of the others. Another suit would come and so he'd sew one of the others. He just started doing that and he just kept doing that. And, that, and the, the suits and the clothes kept coming and so he just kept doing that. And so then he got involved with the mission field and particularly in Kenya. Jerry has started churches and hospitals in Kenya and uh, the, the main hospital that he sold back in the days of the City of Faith and, and Oral Roberts University staffed that hospital until it came up and was on its own. Jerry Savelle is an apostle to Kenya. Anyway, and so he started giving his clothes to his preachers that were graduating out of his school. And, and some of them just standing there in their clothes. This one fellow, I tell you, I, he's just imprinted in my mind. And his sleeves came down to about here. And Jerry's britches came down about like that on. And he was standing there with his Bible in his hand. He was so thrilled. Glory to God. Somebody, there was a, an 18 wheel trailer pulled up to his office with 1,500 pair of britches. 1,500 pair, and he sewed them all. <laughs> Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord Jesus. We're sowers. Father, we thank you tonight. We thank you tonight. We're so blessed, and we, we praise your name. We praise your holy, blessed name. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Praise you, Lord Jesus. Let's just praise the Lord here for a moment. Thank you, Lord Jesus. It just flashed across my mind the word of the Lord that came to Pastor George in, in all of this um, that you've been hearing about all of that damage that happened in, uh, there in Fort Worth at our ministry headquarters and all that. And uh, we, we, we lack some going over the budget, but it's still coming in because it's, it's coming in from, from all over. But he used the word golden gate of opportunity. Why did the Lord use that term? It is golden. We're standing at the gate, but it is golden. That gold represents the financial prosperity of the body of Christ coming together in, in this small thing that's happened to us. Oh yeah, it's small, I mean, six million dollars. You mean that small? Oh yeah. As long as it looks small to you, it's easy. <laughs> when it starts looking big, Oh, brother, that looks like a lot of money to me. Now, wait a minute. I'm going to have to stop and teach a little bit here. So hang on to you, get fiddle. I'll be done here in a minute. <laughs> Heavenly economics. The Lord, the Lord dealt with me one time. He said, um, where is your choke point? And I mean, this just 
came a bit out of the blue. Where is your choke point? I don't mean I heard a, an audible voice. I've only heard what I thought was the audible voice one time in my life. And it had to do, you've heard us use the term, the, the revival capital of the world. I came in late one night and I was in the airplane by myself and I heard these words, coming to you from the revival capital of the world. And it startled me. I looked down at the audio panel to see if I'd flip, somehow flipped that, that low frequency radio on. And I never do that. I never, I don't even attempt to mess with any kind of entertainment when I'm flying. That's business. Stick that thing up like a dart somewhere. You get to messing around with other stuff. And I looked down there and, I, and then I saw that it wasn't audible. And I thought, man, I know where the, entertainment capital of the world is Hollywood. I know where the country music capital of the world is, Nashville, Tennessee. I know where the political capital of the world is, Washington, D.C. Where's the revival capital of the world? And then I forgot about it because it was night and I was just about to have to call the tower. Well, I had just flown over the property that we now have and I didn't know it. And then one of our board members came in and said, uh, Brother Kenneth, there's some property out here north of town I think you should look at. Okay, so we went out there and it was Eagle Mountain Naval Air Station Marine Base during World War II. And so we walked up there and of course it's just abandoned. And uh, and I walked up there and did the barbed wire fence like this and Gloria crawled through it. And then I walked over it like this. And when I got over the fence and stopped, I heard it again. This is the revival capital of the world and you're going to build it. I had zero dollars. <laughs> Amen. Hallelujah. But I learned how to be a sower. In that little red Cessna that I was talking about earlier, I had forgotten all about this. But right after, right after we got that little airplane, I, thought, I want to take Jerry Svelle riding in it, of course. And so we got in it and we flew it around and I landed, I had totally forgotten this. He remembered it because he and his dad were automobile race fans. His dad raced, Jerry raced. They, and that used to be, they used that air base for sports car races. And he knew the place. We landed out there and just as I landed, I turned around to Jerry and I said, Jerry, someday we're going to own this place. I said it. Well, today is someday. <laughs> Thank you, Lord. Thank you. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. And it was absolute, total, complete, functional, absolute, bona fide miracle the way it came to pass. I mean, it couldn't happen, but it did. Couldn't happen, but it did. It couldn't, but it did. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord.